I was a postdoc at MIT. A postdoc at MIT, um, and as a space telescope, and then, and then jumped uh, uh, to Yale. Uh, he's gotten many honors. Uh, he was awarded the Henry John Cannon Award in astronomy, which is a, a, a high honor for women. Um, and then multiple other awards. Uh, she's a member of the American Physical Society. She was elected a couple years ago to the National Academy of Sciences. Um, uh, she won the George Van Buchwick Prize. Uh, and was the president of the American Astronomical Society uh, a few years ago. Um, so uh, we're very honored to have Meg here uh, tell us about what she's been up to lately. So thank you, Meg. Thank you, Dan. <coughs> uh, can you hear me? Is this on? I mean, that's kind of, thank you. It doesn't? It doesn't. It, it doesn't. It's subtle. It's oh, it's only for this guy. I thought I'm helping you, all you poor deaf people here. <laughs> OK. Well, I don't know if you can read this or not. Uh, here's the translation. New insights into the cosmic growth of supermassive black holes. Supermassive black holes grow at the centers of galaxies over the billions of years since the Big Bang. And uh, my group has focused on quantifying that growth. And what I'll tell you about today is a new um, calculation we've just finished, which it models all of the production, uh, all, let's see, models all of the accretion growth. Let's put it that way. So I'm going to explain to you what I'm talking about and what that means. But before I move on from the galaxy font, let me just say, uh, there are so many different looking galaxies in the universe that you can make a font out of it. And the Galaxy Zoo people have done that. So I always start my talks with a title written in galaxies. And if you want to write in galaxies, you can go to this website, writing.galaxyzoo.org, and write your name or your manifesto or whatever you like. <laughs> Type it in, and it will come out in galaxies. <laughs> so the variety of galaxies is kind of interesting. Here's just a montage of a bunch of different looking galaxies. You see some spiral galaxies, much like our own. The one in the upper right is a spiral galaxy, somewhat like the Milky Way, massive galaxy, um, with stars forming in spiral arms and dust lanes. In the middle, you see something with a pretty huge bulge and maybe a little bit of a disk. And um, in the upper left, you see two galaxies that are thinking about merging. Um, they aren't actually thinking about it. <laughs> Gravity is doing the thinking for them. Gravity is a very weak force, but it has a long time to operate. And any two galaxies come close to each other at a slow enough velocity, they will merge. So uh, that happens all over the universe. And when they merge, they tend to become ellipticals. Like, for example, this galaxy, let's see if I can get, yeah, this galaxy here, we would call probably an elliptical galaxy or spheroidal galaxy. That probably is two disk galaxies that have merged and their angular momenta have canceled, essentially. So they have stars in triaxial orbits. So what, what these galaxies have in common is that at the centers of every galaxy above a certain mass, uh, they all have supermassive black holes. That means black holes that are at least a million solar masses. Uh, in some cases, a billion. Yeah, I probably don't, but thanks. Thank you for that. Um, students, I think you should not use a laser pointer except when you need it. Just saying. <laughs> I was telling, them, <laughs> telling some of the students about, yeah, I have peculiarities about talks. That's one of them. OK, so um, there was a black hole at the center of these. We know their masses from a variety of, uh, or at least roughly know their masses. And they were not born uh, 100 million solar masses. They had to grow to that size. They probably started as seed black holes that were anywhere from 100 solar masses 
to some theories have perhaps 100,000 solar masses. But in any case, they, they, most of their mass was acquired through accretion. So gravity is attracting matter to the black hole, and it's, some of that matter is ingested, and the black hole mass increases. Why doesn't all the galaxy just fall into the black hole? It's a two-word answer. I will give a prize if a student gives me the answer. Angular momentum. Was that a student? I don't think so. Was that a student? Yes. You are a student. You get a prize at the end. OK. <laughs> and actually, the next two students who ask me a question also get a prize. I give out three prizes. It's angular momentum, right? You have to lose angular momentum in order to fall in. That's very hard. So um, uh, the process of how these black holes grow is not entirely clear to all of us. I mean, the physics is clear, but not, not the details. OK, why should we care? Um, when I was a youngster, I studied these objects, and not that many people were interested. But then we realized that the growth of black holes is probably very tightly uh, connected to how the galaxy around them grows and how this wild variety of galaxies comes to be. So there are four pieces of evidence I'll cite to, um, to establish this connection. One, I've just already said that pretty much every galaxy has a black hole in the center that grew. That is a modern conception. I see in this audience a range of ages, shall we say. So the older of you, people my age, remember perhaps that we used to think that only a few galaxies had black holes in them. And those were the ones we called active galaxies. We could see the energy they were emitting because matter was falling in, radiation was being emitted. Um, but we thought most galaxies didn't have a black hole. This is really a stupid idea. Like all things, when you discover the truth, what you thought before was stupid. Um, clearly, every galaxy uh, has a black hole now, we know, um, in part from the Hubble Space Telescope. And thus, every galaxy has had energy dumped in it because the black hole was growing. And the gravitational potential energy was converted to, among other things, radiation. So uh, potentially a big effect. Um, also, the black holes in the stars over the past billions of years have been growing contemporaneously. And I'll show you a plot that, that illustrates that. This is time uh, across the bottom. It, well, it's redshift, but anyway. On the left is the present day, redshift zero. The age of the universe, I, I think I'm off by a tenth. It's 13.8 billion years. And the Big Bang is way off to the right, but this plot starts at a half a gig year after the Big Bang. And then as we go left, time is progressing. So you see that at the present day, there's a certain amount of star formation. That's on the y-axis on the left. And uh, that's Ill um, the brown points are the star formation estimates. And you see that it increases from the present day back to redshift of about 2 and then declines again to higher redshift. And the gray line is a representation of the mass accreted in black holes uh, as measured by summing up the radiation. So it's an estimate of all the radiation that's been emitted by accretion into black holes. Um, and then you, you use an efficiency factor to get to uh, black hole mass. And I realize I've cut off the scale for the black hole mass, but these are scaled somewhat arbitrarily by that efficiency. But you see that black holes do the same thing. From the present day back to redshift 2, there's a very similar amount of, of um, increase to uh, the earlier universe where there was more, much more star formation and much more black hole growth. So that doesn't say it's happening together in an individual galaxy, but it says that galaxies as a whole tend to be forming their stars and growing their black holes at the same time. OK, the real kicker that made everybody sit up and take notice was something called the M sigma relation. So I'm just going to show it to you and explain it. This is a correlation between black hole mass, the mass of the black hole at the center of the galaxy, that's on the y-axis, and the stellar velocity dispersion in the host galaxy. So those of you who remember first semester mechanics um, may think, yeah, sure, of course. The stars are orbiting the black hole, so of course their velocity reflects the mass of the black hole, right? That's like a freshman physics problem, it's how you weigh the sun. But Although the black hole has a, a potentially a huge impact on the galaxy, in fact, its binding energy, the, sorry, the binding energy of the galaxy is comparable to the amount of energy released over the full lifetime of the growth of the black hole. 
its mass is actually small. I mean, it's big for a thing. It's big compared to star, but it's not big compared to the galaxy. It's about a, th a thousandth of the mass of the galaxy in a typical case. So most of the stars have no idea there's a black hole in the center, gravitationally speaking. Okay, so they don't feel the gravity of the black hole. In that case, why should there be any kind of correlation at all? Why should the velocity of the stars have anything to do with the black hole mass? And this was a puzzle. It still is a puzzle, I guess. But people have postulated that the growth of the black hole and the amount of stars formed in the galaxy are somehow mediating each other. And this concept is called feedback. And it can go both ways. Perhaps the AGN, oh, sorry, I didn't define AGN. Whew. As the black hole's growing, emitting radiation, we call it an active galactic nucleus because the center of the galaxy, its nucleus, is active. Nothing to do with nuclear physics, obviously. So uh, AGN is the term we use for any one of these uh, galaxies in which the black hole is growing at a rapid rate at the current moment. Okay. So um, uh, I forgot where I was going before I defined that. Uh, anyway, this M sigma relation, people took it to mean that there was some kind of feedback. The AGN could influence star formation. Maybe it could quench star formation by heating the gas so it could no longer condense to form stars. And perhaps stellar processes would mediate the amount of mass that could fall into the black hole. So it can go um, both ways. And finally, theorists, this is probably the real reason, theorists decided that they need this injection of energy from black hole growth. And I'm not, gonna, um, I'm not gonna give you the full argument here, but it basically has to do with the fact that if you, we, we now have a very simple initial condition physics problem in the universe. We've measured the anisotropies in the mi cosmic microwave background. So we know the initial density fluctuations at an age of about 380,000 years after the Big Bang. And we can just run the clock forward with gravity and ask what happens, okay? There are a couple things you find out. One is that you need a lot of dark matter to form galaxies. If you didn't have a lot of dark matter, we wouldn't be here. Um, but the other thing is that the galaxies you form are almost OK, uh, but it's kind of, they're kind of uh, wrong also. The, the medium mass galaxies come out about right. You get about the right number of them at about the right mass. But at low masses, the, these simple computer models predict many more galaxies than are seen, small galaxies. And at high mass, we predict many more high mass galaxies than are seen. And without going into a long other talk, <coughs> uh, at low mass, supernovae are thought to disrupt the, is that me? I thought I turned off my sound. No, it is me, isn't it? It is this. Oh, shut up. Well, it's not showing me the little noise thing, so you'll just have to, every time you hear that, you realize an email has arrived, and I have more work to do. So I apologize. Thank you. It's much better. OK, I have to focus here. OK, so what do theorists do? So at low mass, supernovae can blow matter out and stop certain galaxies from forming. That's one idea. At high mass, the AGN in the center could do the same. So injecting a lot of energy into the galaxy could prevent stars from forming, and thus the very massive galaxies don't appear in our universe. That's the idea. And here is the illustration. This is a computer simulation from the illustrious group. What you're watching is the development of large-scale structure in dark matter. So blue is coding for dark matter, um, showing you over time that it gets clumpier uh, in the dense parts and the empty parts get emptier. In the left, uh, lower left corner, you see the age since the Big Bang. So we're at about one and a half billion years. And um, you see uh, galaxies and clusters of galaxies forming. In a moment, you'll see this change of color. Now we are looking not at density of dark matter, but at temperature. And here, you'll start to see things that look like bombs going off. The little flickery bombs are supernovae in galaxies, which are helping to keep small galaxies from forming. And the big bombs, like that one, is an episode of accretion onto a black hole. So it happens over a short period. We don't know how short, whether it's 1,000 years or 100,000 years.
But in that period, a tremendous amount of energy is released into the galaxy. And depending on how it couples to the interstellar medium, to the matter in the galaxy, it may prevent star formation or stop the star formation that's happening. So um, these kinds of simulations, many, many theorists have done these simulations, and they find that if they turn the knob of energy injection by black hole growth, they can produce the spectrum of galaxies that we see, the distribution of galaxies that we see. Now, whether that means that's what really happens, I think, is another question. Uh, this, by the way, just to let it keep running because it's pretty, um, this uh, purple is chemical abundance. So it's showing you the chemical abundances in the intergalactic medium as a function of time. And white is high chemical abundances, and dark is low. So this is where the elements that made you and me and the room and everything came from. They came from the forges, uh, the fusion in the center of stars. OK, time is passing, so we'll move on. OK, so a big question that theorists need to answer and that we just generally want to answer anyway is how much energy are these AGN injecting into the galaxy? And a question that I would put it in this sense, because I'm interested in the black holes, how much mass have they accreted and when and at what rate? And those are things we can, we can estimate from looking at radiation. So what I'm going to talk about today is the following. Um, well, actually, I'm not really talking about the second thing, so I'll get to that. Um, the accretion history of AGN, which is a new project that um, I'm doing with Dave Sanders at Institute for Astronomy in Hawaii. Uh, my postdocs came up with the acronym AHA. For those of you who remember the 80s, it comes with a theme song. Um, Oh, darn, what is the name of it? Uh, it's a great music video that you've probably seen, and I'm not going to tell you the name of it, because then it will be an earworm for the rest <laughs> of your. <laughs> I have it on my iPhone. I'll play it for you after. It's very catchy. Anyway, the accretion history of AGN is, is what it says. When and where did they grow? And so first I'm going to tell you why we have to look with a multi-wavelength census, why we can't just go do an optical survey and be done, or rather, People have done optical surveys and that we are not done. Uh, so first I'll explain that. Then I'll explain why we need a wedding cake survey. I will also explain what that is. And then I'm going to tell you about this population synthesis model that my graduate student, Tanima Nana, just finished, which is a comprehensive description of basically the growth of black holes in producing X radiation. I was going to talk about host galaxies. That was in my abstract, I admit. But on the plane, I put in all these new slides about the population synthesis. So I thought, in <coughs> deference to your, your time and respect for your time, I, I pulled some out. So if you wanted to hear about the effect on galaxies, I'll just tell you the answer. This is probably more effective than a talk, because you'll maybe remember. So we don't see much effect on most galaxies. So this nice feedback picture that I've just spent a lot of time selling you um, it does happen in some galaxies that merge. Mergers that turn into ellipticals that trigger AGN do seem to have a feedback happening. But most galaxies just noodle along with secular evolution unrelated to mergers or to AGN feedback. That's the ev what the evidence is telling us. Sorry. OK. okay. Multi-wavelength census of black holes. So as I say, most of the work on AGN, you may have heard them called quasars, happened uh, in the optical for the first few decades. And the problem with that is that optical light is fairly easily extinguished, especially when you start talking about distant quasars, distant AGN. You're looking at rest frame ultraviolet emission, and that's easily scattered out of the line of sight by a little bit of dust. So any, uh, any object, galaxy, AGN, with some dust in it, you wouldn't see it in rest frame UV light. So those censuses were extremely incomplete. So instead, today we use x-rays, and in particular hard x-rays, which can penetrate through gas and dust and can uh, escape all but the most heavily obscured environments. So they, they're, pretty, they're not only a pretty uh, unbiased tracer, but they also are very efficient. Because when you do an x-ray survey, in extragalactic x-ray survey, 90 plus percent of the objects you find are AGN. So you aren't wasting your time with a lot of pesky galaxies. 
in the infrared, you actually see 100%. You don't miss any. But 99% of them are galaxies with star formation, not AGN. And also, you have to separate the infrared light that comes from stars and the infrared light that comes from accretion, which is a hard cap. So we like x-rays as a pointer. They're like a signpost saying, over here, black hole growing, here, x-rays. OK, so um, we use all three because the soft x-ray light and the UV light is absorbed. And that gets re-rated in the infrared. And you can do an energy balance to make sure that you've correctly, you've correctly understood that. And then the optical is very helpful for studying the host galaxy. So we do all three. And um, yeah, you may have heard of the Sloan Digital Sky Survey. I think some of you here. Um, so they have uh, found many quasars. And in the early days, they sort of uh, poo-pooed what we were doing. Uh, well, not really. But I like to make artificial conflict just to resolve it later. Um, because you know, they said, we found 100,000 quasars. What more do you need? But they found mainly unobscured quasars. And the question was, are there obscured quasars? So now I'm going to tell you why I think there are obscured quasars. So first, this cartoon is a not-to-scale representation of the elements that we think are in the centers of active galactic nuclei. There's a black hole, conveniently co colored black. There's a pink donut, which is meant to represent the accretion disk. So matter trying to fall into the black hole settles into a disk because of angular momentum. Um, outside that, there are clouds orbiting. These are photoionized clouds of gas orbiting the black hole. The ones that are close to the black hole move quickly, and so they emit lines that are Doppler broadened, and we call them broadline clouds. And the ones that are far away are moving slowly. So their lines are narrow, so we call them narrow line clouds. Another point. Yeah, good. Um, <laughs> astronomers are really, you know, we, we, if we don't name it type 1 and type 2, we name it by the whatever it is. Um, and then the, really the key point in the, for my talk is this donut, the big, the big orange donut, uh, the torus, which probably doesn't, really doesn't look like that. But the idea is that there's a, some kind of azimuthal distributed gas and dust, which is thick and prevents ultraviolet light and soft x-ray light from penetrating. So if you, look, if you look through the hole, you see in the center of the accretion disk bright UV emission, soft x-ray emission, and of course hard x-ray emission. If you look from the side, you don't see the UV or soft x-ray. It's absorbed from your line of sight. In fact, you might not even see that there's any activity there at all. You might see just an ordinary galaxy. So um, we know that this picture is roughly correct locally from many lines of evidence. It's also likely it was more true earlier in the universe when there was more gas around, fewer stars. You know, The gas hadn't yet formed stars. So it's almost certainly more true at higher redshift. And maybe the most direct evidence is something we call the hard x-ray background. So it's not a background. Uh, it was called the background because in 1962, when the first rocket went up, uh, the, 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 it, the observation, there were two key observations. SCOX-1, the first x-ray source detected, and then the fact that the sky was super bright in x-rays in all directions, uniformly uh, independent of you know, where you were and where you were pointing. And um, the spectrum of that x-ray background, so this is physics, is shown here. This is intensity versus energy from about a kilovolt on the left to about 100 keV on the right. And what all I want you to notice now, we'll come back to this figure. All I want you to notice now, uh, well, I'll just say there's a couple data sets involved. But on this picture, an AGN spectrum would be roughly flat. The x-ray background is the superposition of all AGN spectra. This is what Ricardo Giacconi got the Nobel Prize for a few years ago for, for positing that. So if you take unobscured AGN, which have a horizontal, basically a horizontal line in these units, this is intensity versus uh, per unit uh, decade, you can't add them up and get this curved spectrum. The curvature is because at low energies, there's photoelectric absorption. Okay, You have photons 
that are trying to get out of, away from the, uh, the photons produced by accretion onto the black hole, trying to escape to get to our telescope. But they run into some gas, and they, if they have low enough energy, they get absorbed. Okay, and that depresses the flux at low energies. And if you assume an assortment of absorption levels, you, get ex you can easily fit this aggregate spectrum of the X-ray background. So let me restate. The curvature of the X-ray background told us 30 years ago that most AGN are heavily obscured. But because most astronomers are optical astronomers, that didn't really sink in. Okay. So we use telescopes like the X-ray Chandra X-ray Telescope and XMM Newton X-ray Telescope, and the Hubble Telescope in the optical IR and Spitzer in the infrared. Um, we also use telescopes on Mauna Kea. Whoops, I went by too quickly. Hold on, my computer evidently got confused. Okay, Mauna Kea. If you're a graduate student um, and you wish to suffer, you should go observing at Keck. The Starbucks is across the street, I'm just saying. <laughs> OK, so the, the reason I'm just, this is my first third. The reason we need a multi-wavelength census is we're trying to find those obscured black holes. How many are there? How many did we miss in those optical surveys? So we're using x-ray, infrared, optical. OK, on to wedding cakes. So uh, AHA is a wedding cake survey. The idea is that you have different levels of survey. So you have a big area that's very shallow survey, a smaller area that's deeper, an area that's smaller still that's deeper, and so on. And um, this is really important. We didn't used to do this. So let me explain why this is important. The distribution of luminosities of AGN is called a luminosity function. The number is a function of their luminosity. And it, like almost every luminosity function in nature, there's lots of low luminosity things and few high luminosity things. I mean, the shape changes, but basically, you have an abundance of small and a dearth of big, right? Isn't that true about everything? Rich people, lots of rich, you know, lots of poor people, not very many rich people. Uh, you could think of your own examples. Okay. Anyway, if you do a small survey, so you you survey a small area of sky, and of course. You know, you've only got so much universe going this way. That's kind of finite. So small area translates to small volume. If you do a small air volume survey, you only see the common things, the things there are a lot of. Okay, so, and those are low luminosity things. So when you do a small volume survey, you are sampling the lower luminosity universe. If instead you look at high luminosity, then you're sampling something that's rare and you need a large volume to access it. So people, yeah, people didn't think about this until I would say the last decade. So they thought they had done a survey and it was done. But you have to combine surveys of different reach, if you like, to get the full picture. And it, this is true for any rare population. So it's also true for high redshift quasars. You have to have very large volume surveys to find them. So that's why Sloan, the Sloan Digital Sky Survey, finds so many high redshift quasars, because their, their survey is all sky. It's very large volume. It's not deep at all. It's incredibly shallow. So they see only the super, super luminous things. They don't see the sort of ordinary AGN at all at high redshift. OK, so back to our wedding cake. We have four tiers of our wedding cake. And the surveys are called Goods, Cosmos, Stripe 82X, and Swift Bat. So let me tell you what they are. Goods was the first. This was really the first deep multi-wavelength survey. It's uh, an acronym, of course, standing for Great Observatories Origins Deep Survey. I helped uh, design this survey when I was still at the Space Telescope Science Institute. My idea was to look for obscured black hole growth by combining uh, infrared and op infrared Spitzer observations with optical Hubble observations and the deep x-ray field. Um, I helped come up with the acronym, but I have to say, I was against adding the word origins, uh, but we felt, uh, others felt <laughs> that it was too obnoxious, so 
good it became. And this is about a tenth of a square degree on the sky. So it's, it's two fields and uh, about a quarter the size of the full moon. OK, Cosmos was 10 times bigger, more than 10 times bigger. This is an x-ray image of the Cosmos field, uh, which is about one and a half square degrees. I was involved in the survey, but did not lead it. The Stripe 82X survey is one that my group at Yale is leading. Um, without going into all the details, it's a hard x-ray survey. It's about 30 square degrees at the present moment, and we hope to triple that volume. But we already have 6,000 AGN with redshift and everything, and lots and lots and lots of multi-wavelength data, including Herschel far infrared data, which is very hard to come by. Um, if you look at this, oh, I need a laser pointer. And I have one. OK, if you look at this, see these little things here? These are the two good fields, CDF, uh, Chandra Deep Field North, Chandra Deep Field South, and here's Cosmos. And you can see how much bigger this field is. This is the part we've already done, this part here. And then we hope to get the full, the full amount that was observed with Herschel. OK, and the last tier is an all-sky tier, the SWIFT BAT, all-sky survey. SWIFT is, is a hard x-ray mission that has a very hard x-ray um, 14 to 195 keV response. So uh, it, uh, uh, it's nearly unbiased with respect to obscuration, more so than Chandra and XMM. They are, oh, that should say 1,000 AGN. I must have deleted one. <laughs> deleted an order of magnitude. They're 1,000 AGN, mostly low redshift. It's a very shallow survey. So the only thing they see at high redshift are beam sources. But it's very complete, lots of multi-wavelength data. Um, my graduate student, Mary Powell, has um, gotten black hole estimates for, mo for many of them and is doing AGN clustering measurements, on, has actually published AGN clustering measurements on this sample. Interestingly, this is an aside. For those who are interested, she finds a difference between type 1 and type 2 AGN uh, in the clustering in, in the environment, which she thinks might be due to assembly bias. Who was I talking to today who was working on assembly bias? I forget. Yeah, OK. Anyway, just a thought. OK, so um, whoops, I skipped the slide again. So this is just to show this luminosity redshift plane. Uh, each, OK, let's see. This is really, this is, this is like recapping why it's important to do a wedding cake. The good survey is this, uh, the CDF South is this ye these yellow points. This here, this uh, very sharp cutoff is the flux limit of the survey. So this is the, these are the faintest objects you can see. And then they get brighter going up this way. Okay? But at some point, you run out of objects because you run out of volume. Okay? You can't see brighter objects because you run out of volume. So then the next survey in blue is Cosmos. It's much bigger. So you start picking up those more luminous objects. This is the Cosmos flux limit here. And then you go, you have objects that go up that way. Black and, and red are the next layer, Stripe 82X and XF, uh, one called XMM XXL. It's like a tongue twister. So more luminous still. And then Swift Bat is this last thing. Uh, more luminous still, but mostly at very low redshift. So you see how any one survey has actually an extremely strong luminosity redshift correlation that is going to mess up all your results. You won't know whether you're, you're seeing something that is changing with time or that's changing with luminosity. But when you have the ensemble, you cover much more of the LZ plane. So now you can see things as a function of luminosity and redshift independently. OK, third part of the story is the population synthesis model. How many of you have ever heard that term before? I think it's a bad name. So the x-ray people, of course, have heard that term. OK, so um, it just means, what did the population do? OK, and it's effectively, what is the evolving luminosity function? What is the density of objects per unit volume, per unit luminosity, uh, per unit redshift, because it changes over epoch? And in our case, when we're talking about x-ray luminosity functions, we have to talk about NH, the absorbing column density along the line of sight in terms of the equivalent hydrogen column density. Of course, x-rays are not being absorbed by hydrogen. They're being absorbed by carbon, oxygen, nitrogen, heavier elements. But we assume solar abundances typically and just parameterize it with one absorption. So uh, this was first done in the 
uh, well, what's that, 30 years ago, in order to explain the X-ray background. Basically, a population synthesis was adding up spectra of AGN, what their X-ray spectra we think they look like, add them up, can we fit the X-ray background? Can we, can we make that curved spectrum that I showed you earlier? Then in um, the early 2000s, my graduate student, uh, Ezekiel Trester, did the first multi-wavelength population synthesis model. So he didn't only look at the X-rays, he also looked at the infrared and optical. This was basically to interpret the goods data. His PhD was on understanding the AGN population that was uh, revealed in the goods data. And it was remarkably successful. He, he was able to fit the X-ray background spectrum, but also to explain the distribution of fluxes in the infrared, optical, and X-ray, and the redshift distributions, and the fraction of Compton thick AGN. I haven't said what Compton thick AGN are. OK, some AGN, with, when, the, it's a, when the column density is high enough so that the optical depth to Compton scattering is unity or higher, those objects are said to be Compton thick. And that's a column density of about 10 to the 24 atoms per square centimeter. So above that column density, we call them Compton thick. So this was a really remarkable um, success. Um, and the key outcome of it was not just that we could describe, you know, it's like not just that we could make a map, but that the map said that three quarters of all black hole accretion in this part of the population was uh, heavily obscured. And these objects would not have been seen in optical surveys. So they would not have been counted in any census. So if you like, it's even worse than the US census. Because we'd miss three quarters, not just 20% or whatever it is we're going to miss uh, this time. OK, so uh, fast forward to my new graduate, uh, my, well, she's not new anymore, uh, Tonima Onana, whom we asked to make a new population synthesis model. And the reason was Ezekiel had had the goods data. So he had x-ray, infrared, and optical uh, number counts, log n, log s, uh, uh, number of objects as a function of their flux, and their redshift distribution, and the cosmic microwave background, five things. He had five things to constrain the model, and some other observables. I, I, I'm, but here is what we have today. This is a table. I do not expect you to be able to read, but there are a dozen surveys represented here. Each one of them has flux distributions, redshift distributions, et cetera, and we have a much better measurement of the cosmic X-ray background. So it was time. It was time to rethink, to use the more data to look at this model again. And that's what Tanima did. She used, again, a luminosity function. She basically went and looked at the existing luminosity functions uh, um, that had been developed by others based on data and said, do these explain what we see? And the answer was no, none of them pr could explain everything. Um, we looked at x-ray spectra, so that's an input, and we looked at the distribution of column densities seen in AGN, and that's another input. Um, and in the end, it was actually quite a hard problem because there's so many parameters and so much, so many constraints. Um, so she used to come and show me her plot for fits, and I would say, this isn't good enough. Look, it doesn't really fit there. And she'd say, yes, but if I change that, this other thing's going to change. It's like a Rube Goldberg machine, right? You, you change anything, the whole thing's a mess. So she went away in frustration. She comes back three weeks later, and she says, I've coded up a neural net. I'm like, what? She goes, I've made a neural net, and it decided the weightings of the parameters. And so it, she, she basically taught it to um, adjust parameters so that you would still fit all the constraints. And that's what she did. It's actually pretty clever. So here we are back to the x-ray background. First, I'm going to show you um, what a bad fit looks like. So um, here's, here's a couple. The red line and the green line, these are based on a very important paper, Weta et al. 2014, which was the best uh, x-ray luminosity function of AGN to date, using all the objects then available. And you see that, again, a laser pointer is handy. You see that it fails badly at the low uh, energy end and overproduces at the high energy end or underproduces here. So um, it's not surprising because some of these data were not available when he made his luminosity function. So it's not like they did anything wrong, but they didn't have all the information. Here's another one. Uh, 
Did that actually go? I can't tell if it changed. Yes, it did. So here, this is the aired model that vastly overproduces the x-ray background at the high energy end. So it doesn't work at all. Um, let me show you some of the new data. Here is a plot of log n, log s. This is the number of sources with a flux greater than the amount on this axis. So this is the number of sources per square degree with a flux higher than this many uh, ergs per centimeter squared per second. And this is pretty common, look like nature always does. Lots of low flux things, not many high flux things. All these different surveys are put together. Um, Weta had most of these data, but not the seven megasecond Chandra Deep Field South, which is all those data at the bottom. And he didn't have the Stripe 82 data, which is the high flux end, uh, uh, which is a big improvement over the, the blue points. Um, and here's, here's the fit from Weta, the green line. And you see, it doesn't fit at the low end at all, and not surprisingly, because he didn't have those data. It wasn't any kind of constraint to his model. Similarly, uh, this is the yellow line is aired. He also doesn't fit it, same reason. And this is Buchner. Buchner never tried to fit this, these data or the x-ray background, but um, he, this, this fit is, well, it's bad, but the x-ray background fit, he's like a factor of three too high uh, at all energies, so it doesn't work at all. So what a uh, Tanima's fit is here. I hope you can see that that's much better. And here's her fit to the x-ray background, also much better, going through all the data points. Um, is this the plot I want to show that? No, let's go here. Sorry, this is also her fit. So this is her fit and everybody else's fit. So um, let's see, this line here is the fit from Buchner's luminosity function. His, his data, the data he used to constrain his luminosity function, didn't have high luminosity sources in it. So, he, so it's not surprising that this didn't work. Uh, again, it's not his mistake. It's just he didn't have the same constraints we have. And uh, here's the aired one not fitting up here, the weighted one not fitting there. And there we are going through the points pretty well. If some of you eagle-eyed people Notice, there's a little bit of an excess here. Let me just uh, tell you, that's where blazars start coming in. Blazars contribute at around 100 keV and above. So that's what that is. Um, I want you to gaze at this plot because these three lines here, the dotted line, the dashed line, and this line tell you components of the fit depending on absorption. So we have a, we have a distribution of NH. But if we cut it below 10 to the 22, you get this dotted line. That's the con contribution from essentially unobscured sources. So you see, as I said at the beginning, it's fairly flat, right? They don't have strong curvature except at very high energy, which is from some other process, not absorption, from reflection. So basically, absorption, this would be very flat. This dashed line is column densities from 22 to 24. So those are the heavily absorbed objects. And you see, indeed, they're heavily curved. And then this bit is what we call Compton thick. These are the 10 to the 24 to 10 to the 26 objects, very heavily absorbed. And there are about as many of them as there are unabsorbed, unobscured AGN. So if you weren't looking in the hard x-rays, uh, well, you could find them in the infrared. You could, but it'd be hard work. But if you were looking in the optical, let me say it that way, if you were looking in the optical, you would miss half of the black hole growth in the universe, at least, if not more. There are other things we tested against. Here's a, an example. This is the number of objects per square degree of Compton thick sources. So these are the ones that are most heavily absorbed. Okay? And this happens to come from the Chandra Cosmos survey. So I'm showing you just bits and pieces of all the different data sets we fit. Uh, here are the data points, okay, the number of Compton thick objects as a function of their flux. And here in yellow and green and blue are the three existing luminosity functions before we did our work. And you see they don't fit at all. And here's Tanima's fit. She's right on the money. You can change it a little bit by changing the spectral parameters. You can see from those two lines. 
Uh, this is the swift bat number counts, the flux number versus flux for the swift bat all sky survey. And here again, you see Buchner is low, Aird is high, Weta gets it about right, and so does Kanema. Um, this is cumulative, so these are not independent data points, of course. Okay, so to summarize, yep, good. To summarize what uh, Tanima's population synthesis model tells us, um, a combination, I haven't talked much about NewStar, I'm sure you guys know a lot about it. NewStar, SwiftBat, Chandra, XMM are revealing lots of obscured black hole growth, including at high luminosity, we think. We haven't completely nailed that down yet. We need more, we need more area in Stripe 82, but nonetheless, we, the, the trends seem to be that there's plenty of obscuration even in the population at high luminosity that has not previously been sampled before our survey. Um, a large fraction of AGN are Compton thick. Um, one really fun fact, so we were talking to Ryan Hickox, who also works in this area. He was at a meeting with us, and he mentioned that he had finished a recent study using Chandra data on the fraction of the X-ray background that he can actually resolve into individual sources. And he asked Tanima to use her model to produce a uh, a model fit, not a fit, a model, he just, what was the model relevant to this plot he made and uh, of the fraction as a function of energy and she produced the model and it went right through his points uh, without fitting anything, right, without changing anything and other, the other models that he had including these luminosity functions I've been describing were far off and he had been worried about it but once he saw Tanima's plot he realized that his result was fully explained. Okay, and um, yeah, I've already said that. So this is my last slide. I'm just gonna recap what I've told you in the hopes that you go home remembering it. Uh, Multi-wavelength census is essential to do a proper census of black hole growth. The previous ones were incomplete because they were only one volume but they did show us that a great deal of black hole growth was obscured. So that motivated our wedding cake survey, the AHA survey, um, so that we can sample the full AGN population uh, in both luminosity and redshift. Uh, we are now looking in our Stripe 82X sample in particular to find individual examples of very luminous, very obscured things, and that's taking a lot of time follow-up for spectroscopy. One really interesting thing I didn't talk about, but we'll just tell you, is we've looked at the spectral energy distributions of our ensemble of X-ray selected luminous AGN. And uh, they're very red. They have a lot of infrared emission and not so much UV emission. In sharp contrast to all of the optical survey quasars, which have big UV emission and not as much in the infrared. And what this is, is telling you that you have not, that your optical survey not only didn't find obscured things, it didn't find things which have a different balance of power, right? It didn't find things that were low in the UV and high in the infrared. We're finding them because we're selecting in the X-ray. When you select in the UV, you find UV luminous things. So multi-wavelength, super important. To, we're never gonna have a census of the full population. Unlike the U.S., we don't count every AGN or try to, right? But, we, but, but, but through having a model, we can sort of sample the Venn diagrams of each sampling of real AGN and figure out what the underlying population is. That's what, we, that's what we're doing, and that's what this model is doing. So the population synthesis model, oh, what is it telling me to do something? Uh, it's Outlook. I quit my Outlook, so just so it wouldn't do this. Hang on. Wake up. Wake up. No, it wants to read my email. You may not read my email, so we'll just keep going. Go back. Go back. Go back. Okay. So anyway, uh, the population synthesis model that we've just made seems to work very well to explain the x-rays, and what we're going to do next is add the optical and infrared to the spectral energy distributions and redo the model using the infrared and optical constraints as well. So definitely neural net uh, retraining time. Thank you.
So there, we don't, um, yeah, the things we change are all constrained by data. So for example, let's talk about the x-ray spectra. We have a general x-ray spectral shape which fits the shapes that we see, but we, we don't know the high energy cutoff because we don't observe it. Uh, we, or we observe it in only a few objects. So that's a parameter. What is the high energy cutoff? Do you have a range? We, cons we use the observed cutoff distribution for sw the swift bat sources, but we could fiddle with that. That's not a hard constraint. Um, so most of the constraints are like that. The NH distribution, that is an observed thing. Of course, the thing you observe has been selected from the underlying population. You aren't seeing the real one. You're seeing a selected one, and the selection function depends on what the real one is. So again, there's a little wiggle room there, not a huge amount. Okay, like that. Mm. or a large number of moving objects, is there a correlation there between the, how thick they are and what their, what their luminosity is? Uh, and then the second one was just that you could elaborate more on the black how you could predict the black spot. Yeah, OK. So, so the first question, um, what are the Compton thick sources? That comes from our model. And that comes from the distribution of NH. OK, so we have a number of objects versus their NH. And that, going back to your question, um, that is different for every luminosity, and it's different for every redshift. Um, but but it, it is commensurate with what is observed when we have the data, and it's very smoothly in between. When you integrate up the 20 to 24 objects and the 24 to 26, that's where the 50% comes from. So is that real? Are there really that many Compton Thick ATN? We haven't yet individually identified where those are. Ah, the x-ray background is a constraint, but it is not the number constraint. The number constraint comes from the number counts and the redshift distribution, not from the integral flux. Is actually by number, yeah, because we have to produce those low, low flux counts in the Chandra thing. The other question was, what are we going to do with the black hole, local black hole mass function? And the idea is to redo the Sultan argument with a better population synthesis model. So if we add up all the light, over all the redshift and over all the luminosity, we have a number, and we have a local, local black hole mass, total mass accreted by today, and that gives us a, a ratio, which is a, an efficiency. So here, you will see like the, the spectra that depends on the luminosity, uh, and also you will like assume the distribution of the, the, the hydrogen Yeah, so the distribution of the hydrogen is definitely, definitely does depend on luminosity. Um, we use a lot of different people's observations of it and have it very smoothly between the, between the things that have been observed. So it's different, it, it's slightly lower at high luminosity than it is at low luminosity, and, but it increases with redshift. So those go in opposite directions, essentially. What was the first thing you asked? The spectra. So the spectra we use, a, we probably what we, but that is probably the weakest link of what we've done because we use sort of, we don't have a dependence on luminosity and we don't know some of the parameters. Some of them are very well known. You know, there's a power law, there's reflection. The reflection depends on, you know, how much of the, of the reflector the primary source is seeing and there's lots and lots of constraints on that. So we're mainly being guided by data there. But the um, but details of it are not. For example, we know there are warm absorbers. We don't put that in. Uh, we just have simple absorption and so on. So there's more we could fiddle with there, and I think that's a future work for, for Tamima. To put constraints on the spectra from this from these integral constraints. Um, you showed the picture cartoon of the you know, with the jet. Oh, I forgot to talk about the jets. Oh. <laughs> what, what part do jets play in, in any of this? Let's, shouldn't we put that back up? It's so pretty. So, you know, that's my, you know that's my claim to fame. I'll tell this story for the students. The students should hear the story. No one has ever invited me to write a review talk. Here it is. 
Nobody has ever invited me to write a review talk. The review talk that this uh, cartoon was, uh, it was drawn by somebody at Space Telescope who was an artist, so he did a really nice job. And he drew it, uh, it was for an uh, article in the publications of the Astronomical Society of the Pacific. I just wrote this thing and handed it to them and said, would you like to publish this? And they did. And it is now the 10th most cited astronomy review article of the last 40 years. Uh, I'm telling you this because nobody ever invited me to, give a to write a review article. So sometimes it's worth like stepping up to just tell them, I have something to say. Anyway, the jets are what I was working on when I wrote the review article. So they are relativist extremes, as you know, relativist extremes coming out from the vicinity of the black hole. Uh, uh, they, they don't propagate to large distances in most AGN either because the jet's not intrinsically powerful enough or the galaxy has a dense interstellar medium. But in some sources, they do. And then they're called radio galaxies. Or if the jet is pointing at the Earth, they're called blazars. And that's what I was studying at the time I was writing that, that article. Um, but I tend to ignore them because they're a minority of AGN that, that, are, that have powerful jets. Yeah. But I should say, the only known example we have of AGN feedback is from jets. So uh, it's, and it happens to be in an extraordinarily rare type of galaxy, the big, very massive galaxy at the center of clusters, but it's jets that are inflating bubbles into the intergalactic medium. That's the only observed mode of feedback, directly observed. So we, my group has been using neural nets for a different purpose. Um, I think that's why Tunima was interested. We, we actually were using them to classify gal morphologies of galaxies. And um, what you do with a neural net, for those who don't know, in three sentences is you have a training set of something that you want, to, you want your net to be good at identifying. So let's say it's galaxies. Let's say you want it to be able to identify whether they're round, uh, sorry, spherical, or disks, or you aren't sure. Simple, right? And then you have a training set where you know the answer, which we used uh, Galaxy Zoo and some other things. Um, and you have a set of, uh, you have a network, which could be many architectures, but we used ones others had used. And they have weights and biases, which are basically knobs to turn. And you put in your training thing and ask that it get the right answer. And you adjust the weights and biases until it gets the right answer. Then you have a test set that you put through and see does it, where you also know the answer, and you say, how well does it do? We can do this now with 99% accuracy on more than 70% of galaxies. So we're doing the same thing with this model. We're just asking that, it, that the answer satisfy the constraints we have, okay? So it, that it not get too far from the X-ray background shape, that it not get too far from the number count shape. And so those are the bins it's, it's testing against, and we have a test set and, and a, a, a training set and a test set. And then, uh, and then it just makes sure that you don't get out of range is, is all it does. It's not actually teaching itself anything. It's just, it's a fancy way of, of maintaining the constraints better than a graduate student trying to juggle 50 balls in the air at the same time. Oh, well, the inputs are, I mean, the inputs are just these luminosity functions and stuff. And the outputs are, the cost function is the difference between the spectrum and the fit, okay? And, and then the neural net operates to keep the cost function decreasing, to keep the difference. So it's like a fancy chi-squared uh, gradient descent is basically what it's doing. Yeah. Um, so I'm not saying it doesn't have any impact. I'm just saying it, it's certainly far from universal that every AGN is providing feedback to its galaxy. I think what is instead happening, and there are other lines of evidence for it, is that the accretion of gas onto the galaxy is affected by the halo mass. 
So as the halo mass grows, the accretion of matter onto the galaxy is inhibited because it basically heats up more and then it shocks and it doesn't go in. And that fully explains what we see. This is a paper that Kevin Shawinsky led in 2014. Uh, if you look at the galaxies uh, that are disk dominated, so they have nothing to do with mergers, recent mergers, um, they do not age at all until their halo mass gets fairly high and then they go red pretty quickly. And so it's as if once you hit a certain halo mass, gas can't get in, you run out of gas, you stop forming stars, the star, you know, you quench essentially. There is some quenching caused by AGN when mergers happen, but mergers are rare in the local universe. They're a little more common earlier on, but there's still a minority of galaxies that have major mergers. So you have two galaxies that have a major merger. They become ellipticals. That's how we can tell they just had a major merger. And uh, they appear to go very quickly to the red because they're very few in the blue or the green part of the color space. So they're aging very quickly, and there appear to be AGN in them. So that's the place where we think AGN feedback is playing a role. So that is the classic merger scenario. The, the, the thing I'm disputing is that it, I'm saying it doesn't relate to the majority of AGN, at least locally for sure. OK, there were some students who asked me questions, so they should come down and get their prize. You okay. all are very excellent listeners. I think we have snaps, maybe? That, oh, right on <laughs> <laughs> So stick oh, around, yeah, get sure. a treat, say <laughs> item bag. If you answer the questions, collect your prize. Collect your prize. Where's my prize? Where's my prize? <laughs>